We are back on Morning Line. Our guest is Davidson County Sheriff Darren Hall. Good to have him on during uh, the, the week before the holidays, just wrapping things up as he did with uh, the last minute toy store. There's other things we're going to talk about. We've got some folks that waited through the break. And uh, let's go to Joe on line one. Hi, Joe. Good morning, Nick. Good morning. Sheriff. Hey, good morning, Joe. Okay, uh, just a couple of things right quick here. Wanted to meet, wish uh, both of y'all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year for you and your families and everybody at News Channel 5. Thanks, Joe. And thank you, Joe. Especially Rick and Mary Elena. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. And thank you for the toy store. That was a great thing to have. And uh, one other quick thing, kind of a quick comment. Someone called in a uh, last few days, I don't know when it was exactly, but they were talking about the Sheriff's Department having people deported. Hmm. I, I wish you would kind of touch on that briefly, that the Sheriff's Department's not deporting anybody without they've committed a crime. Okay, that's a good one. You're, not, you're not in uh, enforcement of, of uh, having people deported. Yeah, that's a great question. Now you still will hear sometimes on inmates who are brought in from um, INS if there is a hold to be made, right? Right. Yeah, it's a good, I'm really glad you brought that up, actually. Okay. Um, so, so here's what happens. So a person is arrested for crime in Nashville, a crime. Uh, under the Obama administration, your fingerprints automatically are shared with immigration. Okay. It's not a Trump thing. It's not a Darren Hall thing. It's not a. It's a. It was under President Obama. Your. It's called secure communities. Your fingerprints are automatically shared with the federal government's immigration system. Mm -hmm. So Nick's prints would be shared on DUI, on a, a resisting arrest, or anything else. Those prints go. So if those prints match up in the immigration system that you have violated immigration law before, meaning you've been deported before, then your prints in this system and this system match up and they say wait a minute well, we don't want you to release him because he's been over the border before and back in the country until we get him in front of him. So and this judge. is an important point this is the first time I've thought about this the only way you're going to know is had they been caught before hmm. and had their prints on re so if someone's here illegally and they've never been caught before and they come in you can't just look at them and say oh yeah right. I mean so in that instance, you're not going to do any investigation to find out whether that person, if perhaps you have some reason to suspect right. su suspect that, you don't. So the only thing is if they had been caught before and their fingerprints are on record. Yes. Now, let, okay, me, let me give you, there's, I, there's a few exceptions, but here, here's what they okay. are. Let's say you came in on a visa. Your prints are in the system when you t you have a visa, okay. right? Yep. And as long as you haven't violated the extension of the time, then, then your prints are going to be cleared. All right. But there are ways in which you can violate immigration law, i.e. you came here legally overstayed, you came here oh, sure. Ill illegally and so forth. So, But it's very important to know, the only people immigration system are going to know about is if you are violated immigration law, at least in their mind, All right. um, and that's in the immigration. So when you get arrested locally, those prints are shared, not because of Darren, not because of President Trump's or anybody else's idea. Those prints go directly to immigration. Immigration then notifies local jurisdictions like us, we would like you to hold Nick, Nick Barris um, uh, when he's finished with local charges. So the controversy lately, or in the last year, with, with folks want to stir that up, is that they don't expect me or don't want me to cooperate with the federal government. Okay. okay. Keep in mind, I haven't investigated you at all. I know mm -hmm. nothing about you. I have you locally, and they tell me that they want you federally. Right. I know in my mind what they're really saying is they believe you violate immigration law because they've got your prints on file. Yeah. It's pretty simple math. Yeah. Um, and so when you finish here locally, then we turn you over to the federal government. Federal government. And they do whatever. They do what they want to do. Now, here's an important thing. Joe brought this up. Someone complains about it. The activists in town and other places don't want the facts on this at all. If you ask me today how many people are being done that way in a year, or, or weekly or monthly, I could go over here and show it to you, but it's about 1% of the people who are arrested. Okay. Okay. That is lower, get a, okay. right. yeah, that is lower than it was under President Obama. And the reason I'm using Obama is everyone wants to make it, and I have committed that if, I don't care who the president is, I really mm -hmm. don't worry about that. I don't, I don't say, oh, we're changing our policies, we haven't changed one thing. But I don't like the activists and some of the stories that get out that make it sound like there's all these sweeps and things going on. That may be happening somewhere else. It has not happening in our jail. We're not turning more people over than we ever have. It mm -hmm. is lower than it was under the previous president, presidential administration. And we're not investigating your immigration status at all. It is, a, it is a detainer issued by the federal government because they have your prints on file saying they have a concern about you being in the country. Um, 
that's really what it is. It's not it's not us investigating people, 287G, right. which is what we used to do. Uh, this is pretty simple stuff. The 287G, you would be a little more proactive investigating. Yes. yes. We wouldn't ship your prints. We would actually investigate your status yeah. while you were arrested. That means give us proof of your citizenship right. or things like this. That's no longer happening. Right, right. And let me tell you the flaw in it. The flaw is that if Nick Barris snuck over the border a month ago and was arrested last night for aggravated assault in na downtown Nashville, and he was over the border, uh, let's say, illegally, when you're arrested, on the aggravated assault, your prints aren't in that system. That's right. So guess what? You'll be released mm -hmm, mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of times. That's mm -hmm. what happens every day in Nashville. Yeah. There are people who are undocumented getting arrested, and when they're arrested, if there's no prints in the system, you just keep releasing them over yeah. and over. And the, and the community would be frustrated if they understood that because it's not really a very clean understanding. I mean, if some, someone said, do you check immigration status? No, we don't check anyone's status. Mm -hmm. Do you share prints? Yes, we share prints because that's the previous mm -hmm. presidential administration's mandate. Sure. The truth is those prints are only going to match against someone who has violated immigration law. It would almost be like arresting someone for a crime, and if you came downtown, if you didn't have a previous history, we'll let you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so Just what happens meaning like you get a free pass right. for the one time. And that's what happens. So right now, when you get booked on your new, your new criminal charge, if you haven't violated immigration law in their system, mm -hmm. you'll be let go every time. Well, yeah, but after you serve time, if you're convicted of the original crime you're brought in for, right? Yeah, you, you'll finish your local, yeah, you'll finish local your time, local time, but you could have been over the border mm -hmm. for 10 years or two, 10 days Yeah, illegally in the country. We'll never know that. And you would never know. And we'll now, release him over and yeah, over again. Meaning yeah, he may get arrested again, but you'll keep right. releasing him because you right. don't know. Right, right. Now, when you Point commit an again. aggravated felony, a rape or murder, uh -huh. okay, a rape or murder charge, the immigration system then checks to see you're foreign born, you commit an aggravated felony, and they will investigate to see if they want to come interview you while you're waiting on the aggravated felony. To me, it makes no sense because you're going to serve, if you're convicted, substantial amount of com criminal time for that aggravated felony offense. A, a rape or murder, as you know, is, right. is years upon years. You're going to go for a, way for so a long time, so what's is, the point? Right. Deportation uh -huh. conversations about those cases make no sense to me. Um, you should almost ignore them if you want to think about it because their, their sentence is going to exceed I see what, you're saying. what yep. we're talking about. But the ones that are not checked are people who are committing mid to low level crimes and because they're not being checked they're released every day now whether you believe it's good or bad that's up to you but what you shouldn't do and i don't yeah. know if, the, if joe was talking about us checking status that's not true at all we don't deport people we don't check your immigration status we cooperate with the federal government because the federal government's told us they have something to believe that you're you yeah. violate immigration which law. i think is the way that's it works that's where we are all right let's go to uh brian hi brian hey uh I think that uh, some of those places that they, uh, you know, when they arrest them and they know they've been either charged or convicted of violent crimes before and they're supposed to be deported, some places, I can't remember where it is, like San Francisco, Chicago, I'm not <laughs> sure, New York, they just, they ignore a lot of stuff and they release the people and then they, they go and commit more heinous crimes and stuff, so that's pretty bad, but... Uh, what I want to talk about was, uh, if you remember five, six, seven years ago, there was a national judge, and uh, he was talking about, he was getting ready to retire, and he was saying, hey, I want to talk about something, it's called, uh, I call, he made up the word judicial industrial complex. He said, I, I reference Eisenhower for the military industrial complex. He said, I noticed in the 90s with the harsh sentences, and then even on bonds, and people couldn't afford them. But the, and then when people get out and they get on like probation, I've known guys, and they say it's really hard, probation. You have to pay a lot of money, do a lot of stuff. And they say it's a big money-making operation. They, and the, this Nashville judge, Nick probably remembers, he, he retired about seven years ago, and he goes, I want to warn people about this growing judicial industrial complex. And now he said real concerns about private citizens. He knows, Nick knows, I'm a go voter Republican, so I'm all for it. You know, being conservative, but you know, the thing is, jails should not uh, be run by private enterprises, or I don't even think prisons. I think they, that should be part of the city or the state. And that you believe you you agree with that? I think, don't you? I mean, you're not a big fan of privatizing, you know, the I guess penal system, right? And, right. Uh, but <clears throat> also, he's right though um, that there are a lot of fees involved mm. when you get into the system, mm. <laughs> whether you are completely going to do jail time or not. There are fees involved. Right. Cart costs are the least of it, you know. 
And do any of these inmates uh, have to pay uh, when they get out and owe you money for the meals and stuff they've had? No, no. not that, that I know That doesn't of, work yeah. out. But there, there are costs involved um, that people can't, I th can't pay. I, I think there's a couple things, too, to think about. I, I think the privatization conversation is, is an interesting thing going on around the country. It's, it's um, to me, I, I think... I think to blame privatization on problems isn't a good idea. Um, because I can tell you there are a lot of government officials who go to prison for mismanaging their own jails and prisons. We have mm -hmm. some in this area, some in this county, some in others who have gone to jail that are government people. And that doesn't mean that the government can't run effective jail and prison operations. And I feel the same way about privatization. There are some people in sheriff's jobs who really are more interested in the patrol aspect mm -hmm. of their job. And I've never been a big fan of saying that if that's who you are, and you, a lot of times when you're elected because you were you know, you know, a super detective and did all these great things in your county, the truth is you don't know one thing about running the jail. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm, I'm not for saying that privatization doesn't work in situations like that or others where the city says, here's what we want. We want you to meet these standards. We're going to monitor that to ensure you do that. I mean, if you believe that... that, that um, you know, that that's a bad idea. I can go a lot of places. That, I mean, the mayor right now has proposed doing, shutting down H, I mean, uh, General Hospital and maybe moving that to, in mm -hmm. some cases, even for-profit hospitals. There was a proposal, I don't know whatever, wherever it went, where they were talking about privatizing the airport. Um, you know, there's, oh, yeah. my that, point is, I'm not saying it's the answer, but I really <clears throat> don't like to think that it, it, it's not, and I'm talking about the, the government... I mean, the Department of Corrections here has been through, as long as I've been here, a lot of problems over the years. I mean, you know, and there's both private prison problems and government-run prison problems. And I just think if you manage those contracts in a way and you tell them what to expect and hold them to it, who's to say whether it's the bad apple? Mm -hmm. I don't think you should ever, and I would never do this, privatize our system. I don't believe that. It's, mm -hmm. I'm passionate about what we do. I know a lot of sheriffs that aren't. They're passionate about a whole other aspect of what yeah. they do. And, and I think what's hard to think about is a lot of times that's where the jails end up in trouble. It is where a lot of sheriffs end up in trouble. It's a lot of where a, a lot of systems end up in trouble. And I, I just think that we've got to be careful because if we eliminate an option that mm -hmm. where a, a company comes in and says, we can do this, we can save you money, we can provide the same programming, we can do various things, and hold them to it. I'm not sure it's good or bad. I, I, I mean, personally, I'm too competitive. I believe we can do better than anybody. Right, right. I know a lot of people who know nothing about jails that are over them right now. And it makes me concerned that that's... I, I've seen it. <laughs> that's not the best thing. But All right. Listen, on that note, let's take a break. Uh, we've got more phone calls for you. When we come back, uh, Richard and others, stay where you are. We'll get to you with the sheriff right after this. We'll be right back.